Welcome to the Jesuits by James Wiley. And today we'll be continuing to read at page 31. This Reformation MP3 audio resource is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. Many free Puritan and Reformed resources, as well as our complete online catalog containing classic and contemporary Reformation books, digital downloads, MP3s, videos, DVDs, CDs, and the Puritan hard drive at great discounts uh, are on the web at puritandownloads.com. Also, please consider, pray, and act upon the important truths found in the following quotation by Charles Spurgeon, quote, As the Apostle says to Timothy, so also he says to everyone, Give yourself to reading. He who will not use the thoughts of other men's brains proves that he has no brains of his own. You need to read. Renounce as much as you will all light literature, but study as much as possible sound theological works, especially the Puritanic writers and expositions of the Bible. The best way for you to spend your leisure is to be either reading or praying. End of quote. If you'd like to be added to our email list, please send an email to swrb at swrb.com with the word add in the subject line. Our email list is a double opt-in list, so once you've sent us your email address, you'll be asked by email to confirm that you want to join our list using the email address you've supplied. Your email information will be kept confidential, and you can easily remove yourself from our email list by simply emailing us at swrb at swrb.com with the word remove in the subject line. Once you're on the email list, you'll be alerted to all the new free Reformation resources, free MP3s, free electronic books and texts and so forth that SWRB makes available on the web, as well as, at times, to our best discounts and super specials. We also encourage you to reproduce this audio resource and to pass it on to your friends, but we only authorize this as long as the full contents of the message, including the header and trailer, is not altered in any way, and as long as the audio file is given away for free. And now to SWRB's reading of the Jesuits by James Wiley, which we hope you find to be a great blessing in which we pray draws you nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him. John 14, 6. Well, we're on chapter 6. As I said, it's page 31. So far we have traced the enrollment and training of that mighty army which Loyola had called into existence for the conquest of Protestantism. Their leader, who was quite as much the shrewd calculator as the fiery fanatic, took care before sending his soldiers into the field to provide them with armor, every way fitted for the combatants they were to meet and the campaign they were to wage. The war in which they were to be occupied was one against right and truth, against knowledge and liberty. And where could weapons be found for the successful prosecution of a conflict like this save in the old established arsenal of sophisms? The schoolmen, those Vulcans of the Middle Ages, had forged these weapons with the hammers of their speculation on the anvil of their subtlety, and having made them sharp of edge and given them an incomparable flexibility, they stored them up and kept them in reserve against the great coming day of battle. To this armory, Loyola and the chiefs that succeeded him in command had recourse, uh, but not content with these weapons as the schoolmen had left them, the Jesuit doctors put them back again into the fire. They kept them in a furnace, heated seven times, till every particle of the dross of right and truth that cleaved to them had been purged out. And they had acquired a flexibility absolutely and altogether perfect, and a keenness of edge unattained before, and were now deemed every way fit for the hands that were to wield them, and every way worthy of the cause in which they were to be drawn. So attempered, they could cut through shield and helmet, through body and soul of the foe. Let us survey the soldier of Loyola, as he stands in the complete and perfect panoply his general has provided him with. How admirably harnessed for the battle he is to fight. 
He has his loins girt about with mental and verbal equivocation. He has on the breastplate of uh, probabilism. His feet are shod with the preparation of the secret instructions. Above all, taking the shield of intention and rightly handling it, he's able to quench all the fiery darts of human remorse and divine threatenings. He takes for a helmet the hope of paradise, which has been most surely promised him as the reward of his services. And in his hand, he grasps the two-edged sword of a fiery fanaticism, wherewith he's able to cut his way with prodigious bravery and through truth and righteousness. Verily, the man who has to sustain the onset of soldiers like these and parry the thrusts of their weapons had need to be mindful of the ancient admonition, Take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Shrewd, practical, and precise are the instructions of the Jesuits. First of all, they are told to select the best points in that great field, all of which they are in due time to subjugate and possess. That field is Christendom. They are to begin by establishing convents or colleges in the chief cities. The great centers of population and wealth secured, the smaller places will be easily occupied. Should anyone ask on what errand the good fathers have come, they are instructed to make answer that their sole object is the salvation of souls. What a pious errand! Who would not strive to be the first to welcome to their houses and to seat at their tables men whose aims are so unselfish and heavenly? They are to be careful to maintain a humble and submissive deportment. They are to pay frequent visits to the hospitals, the sick chamber, and the prisons. They are to make great show of charity. And as they have nothing of their own to give to the poor, they are to go far and near to receive even the smallest atoms. These good deeds will not lose their reward if only they take care not to do them in secret. Men will begin to speak of them and say, What a humble, pious, charitable order of men these fathers of the society of jesus are how unlike the franciscans and dominicans who were wont to care for the sick and the poor but have now forgotten the virtues of a former time and are grown proud indolent luxurious and rich thus the newcomers the instructions hint will supplant the other and older orders and will receive the respect and reverence of the best and most eminent in the neighborhood Further, they are enjoined to conduct themselves very deferentially towards the parochial clergy, not to perform any sacred function till they first have piously and submissively asked the bishop's leave. This will secure their good graces and dispose the secular clergy to protect them. But by and by, when they have ingratiated themselves with the people, they may abate somewhat of this subserviency to the clergy. The individual Jesuit takes a vow of poverty, but the society takes no such vow, and is qualified to hold property to any amount. Therefore, while seeking the salvation of souls, the members are carefully to note the rich men in the community. They must first find out who owns the estates in the neighborhood, and what are their yearly values. They are to secure these estates by gift, if possible, if not by purchase. When it happens that they get anything that is considerable, let the purchase be made under a strange name by some of our friends, that our poverty may still seem the greater. And let our provincial assign such revenues to some other colleges, more remote, that neither prince nor people may discover anything of our profits, a device that combines many advantages. Every day their acres will increase. Nevertheless, their apparent poverty will be as great as ever, and the flow of benefactions and legacies to supply it will remain undiminished, although the sea into which all these rivers run it will never be full. Among the multifarious duties laid upon the Jesuits, special prominence was given to the instruction of youth. It was by this arm that they achieved their most brilliant success. Whisper it sweetly in there, uh, the people's ears, that they are come to catechize the children's gratis free, 
wherever the Jesuits came, they opened schools and gathered the youth around them. But despite their zeal in the work of education, knowledge somehow did not increase. The intellect refused to expand and the genius to open under their tutelage. Kingdoms like Poland, where they became the privileged and the only instructors of youth, instead of taking a higher place in the commonwealth of letters, fell back into mental decrepitude and lost their rank in the community of nations. The Jesuits communicated to their pupils little besides a knowledge of Latin. History, philosophy, and science were sealed books. They initiated their disciples into the mysteries of probabilism and the art of directing the intention, and the youth trained in these paths when old did not depart from them. They dwarfed the intellect and narrowed the understanding, but they gained their end. They stamped anew the Roman impress upon many of the countries of Europe. The second chapter of the instructions is entitled, What Must Be Done to Get the Ear and Intimacy of Great Men? To stand well with monarchs and princes is, of course, a matter of such importance that no stone is to be left unturned to attain it. The instructions here, as we should expect them to be, are full and precise. The members of the Society of Jesus are, first of all, to imbue princes and great men with the belief that they cannot dispense with their aid if they would maintain the pomp of their state and the government of their realms. Should princes be filled with a conceit of their own wisdom, the fathers must find some way of dispelling this egregious delusion, and they are to be surrounding them with confessors chosen from their society, but by no means are they to bear hard on the consciences of their royal penitents. They must treat them sweetly and pleasantly, oftener administering opiates than irritants. They are to study their humors, and if in the matter of marriage they should be inclined, as often happens with princes, to contract alliance with their own kindred, they are to smooth their way by hinting at a dispensation from the Pope or finding some palliative for the sin from the pharmacopoeia of their theology. They may tell them that such marriages, though forbidden to the commonalty, are are sometimes allowed to princes for the greater glory of God. If a monarch is bent on some enterprise, a war, for example, the issue of which is doubtful, they are to be at pains uh, so to shape their counsel in the matter, that if the affair succeeds, they shall have all the praise, and if it fails, the blame shall rest with the king alone. And lastly, when a vacancy occurs near the throne. They are to take care that the empty post shall be filled by one of the tried friends of the society of whom they are enjoined to have at all times a list in their possession. It may be well, in order to still more to advance their interests at courts, to undertake embassies at times. This will enable them to draw the affairs of Europe into their own hands and to make princes feel They are indispensable to them by showing them what an influence they wield at the courts of other sovereigns, especially how great their power is at that of Rome. Small services and trifling presents they are by no means to overlook. Such things go a great way in opening the hearts of princes. Be sure, say the instructions, to paint the men whom the prince dislikes in the same colors in which his jealousy and and hatred teach him to view them. Moreover, if the prince is unmarried, it will be a rare stroke of policy to choose a wife for him from among the beautiful and noble ladies known to their society. This is seen, as say the instructions, by experience in the house of Austria and in the kingdoms of Poland and France and in and many other principalities. We must endeavor, say the instructions, with remarkable plainness, but in the belief, doubtless, that the words would meet the faithful eyes of the members of the Society of Jesus only. We must endeavor to breed dissension among great men and raise seditions, or anything a prince would have us to do to please him. If one who is chief minister of state to a monarch, who is our friend, oppose us, and that prince cast his whole favors upon him, so as to add titles to his honor, 
we must present ourselves before him and court him in the highest degree, as well by visits as all humble respect. Having specified the arts by which princes may be managed, the instructions next prescribe certain methods for turning to account others of great authority in the commonwealth, that by their credit we obtain profit and preferment. If, say the instructions, these lords be seculars, we ought to have recourse to their aid and friendship against our adversaries, and to their favor in our own suits and, and those of our friends, and to their authority and power in the purchase of houses, manors, and gardens, and of stones to build with, especially in those places that will not endure to hear of our settling in them, because the authority of these lords serveth very much for the appeasing of the populace and making our ill-willers quiet. Nor are they less sedulously to make court to the bishops. Their authority, great everywhere, is especially so in some kingdoms, as in Germany, Poland, and France. And the bishops conciliated, and they may expect to obtain a gift of new erected churches, altars, monasteries, foundations, and in some cases the benefices of the secular priests and canons, with the preferable right of preaching in all the great towns. And when bishops so befriend them, they are to be taught that there is no less profit than merit in the deed, inasmuch as uh, done to the order of Jesus, they are sure to be repaid with most substantial services, whereas done to the other orders, they will have nothing in return for their pains but a song. To love their neighbor and speak well of him, while they held themselves in lowly estimation, was not one of the failings of the Jesuits. In their own virtues, they were to proclaim as loudly as they did the faults of their brother monks. Their instructions commanded them to imprint upon the spirits of those princes who love us that our order is more perfect than all other orders. They are to supplant their rivals by telling monarchs that no wisdom is competent to counsel in the affairs of state but ours, and that if they wish to make their realms resplendent with knowledge, they must surrender the schools to Jesuit teachers. They are especially to exhort princes that they owe it as a duty to God to consult them in the distribution of honors and emoluments and in all appointments to places of importance. Further, they are ever to have a list in their possession of the names of all persons in authority and power throughout Christendom in order that they may change or continue them in their several posts as may be expedient. But so covertly must this delicate business be done that their hand must not be seen in it, nor must it once be suspected that the change comes from them. While slowly and steadily climbing up to the control of kings and the government of kingdoms, they are to study great modesty of demeanor and simplicity of life. The pride must be worn in the heart, not on the brow and the foot must be set down softly that is to be planted at last on the neck of monarchs. Let ours that are in the service of princes, says the instructions, keep but a very little money and a few movables, contenting themselves with a little chamber, modestly keeping company with persons in humble station, and so being in good esteem, they ought prudently to persuade princes to do nothing without their counsel whether it be in spiritual or temporal affairs. End of quote. Chapter 7. Jesuit Management of Rich Widows and the Heirs of Great Families. The sixth chapter of the instructions treats of the means to acquire the friendship of rich widows. On opening this new chapter, the reflection that forces itself on one is how wide the range of objects to which the society of Jesus is able to devote its attention. The greatest matters are not beyond its strength, and the smallest are not beneath its notice. From counseling monarchs and guiding ministers of state, it turns with equal adaptability and dexterity to caring for widows. The instructions on this head are minute and elaborate to a degree 
which shows the importance the society attaches to the due discharge of what it owes to this class of its clients. True, some have professed to doubt whether the action of the society in this matter be wholly and purely disinterested. From the restriction it puts upon the class of persons taken under its protection, the instructions do not say widows, but rich widows. But all the more on that account do widows need defense uh, against the arts of chicanery and the wiles of avarice, and how can the fathers better accord them such than by taking measures to convey their bodies and their goods alike within the safe walls of a convent? There the cormorants and vultures of a wicked world cannot make them their prey, but let us mark how they are to proceed. First, a father of uh, suitable gifts is to be selected to begin operations. He must not, in point of years, exceed middle age. He must have a fresh complexion and a gracious discourse. He is to visit the widow, to touch feelingly on her position and the snares and injuries to which it exposes her, and to hint at the fraternal care that the society of which he is a member delights to exercise over all in her condition who choose to place themselves under its guardianship. After a few visits of this sort, the widow will probably appear at one of the chapels of the society. Should it so happen, the next step is to appoint a confessor of their body for the widow. Should these delicate steps be well got over, the matter will begin to be hopeful. It will be the confessor's duty to see that the wicked idea of marrying again does not enter her mind. For this end, he is to picture to her the delightful and fascinating freedom she enjoys in her widowhood. And over against it, he is to place the cares, vexations, and tyrannies which a second matrimony would probably draw upon her. And to second these representations, the confessor is empowered to promise exemption from purgatory should the holy estate of widowhood be persevered in. To maintain this pious frame of mind on the part of the object of these solicitudes, the instructions direct that it may be advisable to have an oratory erected in her house with an altar and frequent mass and confession celebrated thereat. The adorning of the altar and the accompanying rites will occupy the time of the widow and prevent the thoughts of a husband entering her mind. The matter having been conducted to this stage, it will be prudent now to change the persons of trust about her and to replace them with persons devoted to the society. The number of religious services must also be increased, especially confession, so that, say the instructions, knowing their former accusations, manners, and inclinations, the whole may serve as a guide to make them obey our wills. End of quote. These steps will have brought the widow very near the door of a convent. A continuance a little longer in the same cautious and skillful tactics is all that will be necessary to land her safely within its walls. The confessor must now enlarge on the quietude and eminent sanctity of the cloister, how surely it conducts to paradise, but should she be unwilling to assume the veil in regular form, she may be induced to enter some religious order, such as that of Paulina, who, so that being caught in the vow of chastity, all danger of her marrying again may be over. The great duty of alms, that queen of the graces, and without which it is to be represented to her she cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, is now to be pressed upon her which alms, notwithstanding, she ought not to dispose to every one, if it be not by the advice and with the consent of her spiritual father. Under this direction, it is easy to see in what exchequer the lands, manners, and revenues of widows will ultimately be garnered. But the fathers deemed it inexpedient to leave such an issue the least uncertain, and accordingly the seventh chapter enters largely into the means of keeping in our hands the disposition of the estates of widows. To shut out worldly thoughts, and especially matrimonial ones, the time of such widows must be occupied with their devotions, 
They are to be exhorted to curtail their expenditure and abound yet more in alms to the Church of Jesus Christ. A dexterous confessor is to be appointed them. They are to be frequently visited and entertained with pleasant discourse. They are to be persuaded to select a patron or tutelary saint, say uh, St. Francis or St. Xavier. Provision is to be made that all they do may be known by placing about them only persons recommended by the society. We must be excused for not giving in the words of the fathers the 14th section of this chapter. That section gives their protégés great license. Indeed, all license, and provided they be liberal and well affected to our society, and that all things be carried cunningly and without scandal. But the one great point to be aimed at is to get them to make an entire surrender of their estates to the society. This is to reach perfection now, and it may be to attain in future the yet higher reward of canonization. But should it so happen, from love of kindred or other motives, that they have not endowed the poor companions of Jesus with all their worldly goods when they come to die, the preferable claims of the Church of Jesus Christ to those of kindred are to be urged upon them, and they are to be exhorted to contribute to the finishing of our colleges, which are yet imperfect, for the greater glory of God, giving us lamps and pyxes, and, and for the building of other foundations and houses, which we, the poor servants of the Society of Jesus, do still want, that all things may be perfected. Quote, let the same be done with princes, the instructions go on to say, and our other benefactors who build us any sumptuous pile or erect any foundation, representing to them in the first place that the benefits they thus do us are consecrated to eternity, that they shall become thereby perfect models of piety, that we will have thereof a very particular memory, and that in the next world, they shall have their reward. But if it be objected that Jesus Christ was born in a stable and had not where to lay his head, and that we who are his companions ought not to enjoy perishing goods, we ought to imprint strongly on their spirits that in truth, at first, the church was also in the same state. But now that by the providence of God she is raised to a monarchy, and that in those times the church was nothing but a broken rock, which has now become a great mountain, uh, well, end of quote. In the chapter that follows, the eighth, uh, namely, the net is spread still wider. It's around the feet of the sons and daughters of devout widows that its meshes are now drawn. The scheme of machination and seduction unfolded in this chapter differs only in its minor points, from that which we have already had disclosed to us. We pass it, therefore, and go on to the ninth chapter, where we find the scheme still widening, and wholesale rapacity and extortion, sanctified, of course, by the end in view, still more openly avowed and enjoined. The chapter is entitled, Of the Means to Augment the Revenues of Our Colleges, and these means, in short, are the astute and persistent deception, circumvention, and robbery of every class. The net is thrown, almost without disguise, over the whole community, in order that the goods, heritages, and possessions of all ranks, prince, peasant, widow, and orphan, may be dragged into the convents of the Jesuits. The world is but a large preserve for the mighty hunters of the Society of Jesus. Above and before all other things, says this instruction, we ought to endeavor our own greatness by the direction of our superiors, who are the only judges in this case, and who should labor that the church of God may be in the highest degree of splendor for the greater glory of God. In prosecution of this worthy end, the secret instructions enjoin the fathers to visit frequently at rich and noble houses, and to inform themselves prudently and dexterously uh, whether they will not leave something to our churches in order to the obtaining remission of their sins and of the sins of their kindred. Confessors, and only able and eloquent men, are to be appointed as confessors to princes and statesmen, 
are to ascertain the name and surname of their penitents, the names of their kindred and friends, whether they have hopes of succeeding to anything, and how they mean to dispose of what they already have or may yet have, whether they have brothers, sisters, or heirs, and of what age, inclination, and education they are. And they should persuade them that all these questions do tend much to the clearing of the state of their conscience. There is a refreshing plainness about the following instructions. They are given with the air of men who had so often repeated their plea, quote, for the greater glory of God, that they themselves had come at last to believe it. Our provincial ought to send expert men into all those places where there is any considerable number of rich and wealthy persons to the end that they may give their superiors a true and faithful account. Let the stewards of our college get an exact knowledge of the houses, gardens, quarries of stone, vineyards, manors, and other riches of every one who lives near the place where they reside, and if it be possible, what degree of affection they have for us. In the next place, we should discover every man's office and the revenue of it, their possessions, the articles of their contracts, which they may surely do by confessions, by meetings, and by entertainment, or by our trusty friends. And, generally, when any confessor lights upon a wealthy person from whom he hath good hopes of profit, he is obliged forthwith to give notice of it and deliver it at his return. They should also inform themselves exactly whether there be any hope of obtaining bargains, goods, possessions, pious gifts, and the like in exchange for the admission of their sons into our society. If a wealthy family have daughters only, they are to be drawn by caresses to become nuns, in which case a small portion of their estate may be assigned for their use, and the rest will be ours. The last heir of a family is by all means to be induced to enter the society, and the better to relieve his mind from all fear of his parents, he is to be taught that it is more pleasing to God that he take this step without their knowledge or consent. Such a one ought to be sent to a distance to pass his novitiate. End of quotes. These directions were but too faithfully carried out in Spain, and to this, among other causes, is owing the depopulation of that once powerful country. A writer who resided many years in the peninsula and had the best opportunities of observing its condition says, quote, If a gentleman has two or three sons and as many daughters, the confessor of the family advises the father to keep the oldest son at home and send the rest, both sons and daughters, into a convent or monastery, praising the monastic life and saying that to be retired from the world is the safest way to heaven. The fathers of these families, glad of lessening the expenses of the house and of seeing their children provided for, do send them into the desert place of a convent, which is really the middle of the world. Now observe that it is twenty to one that their heir dieth, before he marrieth and have children. So the estate and everything else falls to the second, who is a professed friar or nun, and as they cannot use the expression of meum or tuum, all goes that way to the society. And this is the reason why many families are extinguished and their names quite out of memory. The convent so crowded and the kingdom so thin of people and the friars, nuns, and monasteries so rich. End of quote. Further, the fathers are counseled to raise large sums of money on bond. The advantage of this method is that when the bondholder comes to die, it will be easy to induce him to part with the bond in exchange for the salvation of his soul. At all events, he is more likely to make a gift of the deed than to bequeath the same amount in gold. Another advantage of borrowing in this fashion is that their pretense of poverty may still be kept up. Owners of a fourth or of a half of the uh, property of a country, uh, they will still be the poor companions of Jesus. We make but one other quotation from the secret instructions. 
It closes this series of pious advices and is, in one respect, the most characteristic of them all. Quote, let the superior keep these secret advices with great care, and let them not be communicated but to a very few discreet persons, and that only by parts, and let them instruct others with them when they have profitably served the society, and then let them not communicate them as rules they have received, but as the effects of their own prudence. But if they should happen to fall into the hands of strangers who should give them an ill sense of construction, let them be assured the society owns them not in that sense, which shall be confirmed by instancing those of our order who assuredly know them not. End of quote. It was some time before the contingency of exposure here provided against actually happened. But in the beginning of the 17th century, the accidents of war dragged these secret instructions from the darkness in which their authors had hoped to conceal them from the knowledge of the world. The Duke of Brunswick, having plundered the Jesuits' college at Paderborn in Westphalia, made a present of their library to the Capuchins of the same town. Among the books which had thus come into their possession was found a copy of The Secret Instructions. Another copy is said to have been discovered in the Jesuits' college at Prague. Soon thereafter, reprints and translations appeared in Germany, Holland, France, England. The authenticity of the work was denied, as was to be expected, for any society that has, is astute enough to compile such a book would be astute enough to deny it. And to only the fourth or highest order of Jesuits were these instructions to be communicated. The others, who were ignorant of them in their written form, were brought forward to deny an oath on oath that such a book existed, but their protestations weighed very little against the overwhelming evidence on the other side. The perfect uniformity of the methods followed by the Jesuits in all countries favored a presumption that they acted upon a prescribed rule, and the exact correspondence between their methods and the secret advices showed that this was the rule. Gretza, a well-known member of the society, affirmed that the Secreta Monita was a forgery by a Jesuit who had been dismissed with ignominy from the society in Poland and that he published it in 1616. But the falsehood of the story was proved by the discovery in the British Museum of a work printed in 1596, 20 years before the alleged forgery, in which the Secreta Moneta is copied. Since the first discovery in Paderborn, copies of the Secreta Moneta have been found in other libraries, as in Prague, noted above. Numerous editions have since been published, and in so many languages that the idea of collusion is out of the question. These editions all agree, with the exception of a few unimportant variations in the reading. These private directions, says M. L. Estrange, are quite contrary to the rules, constitutions, and instructions which this society professeth publicly in those books it hath printed on this subject, so that without difficulty we may believe that the greatest part of their governors, if a very few be accepted especially, have a double rule as well as a double habit, one for their private and particular use, and another to flaunt with before the world. End of quote. Now chapter 8. Diffusion of the Jesuits throughout Christendom. The soldiers of Loyola are about to go forth. Before beginning the campaign, we see their chief assembling them and pointing out the field in which their prowess is to be displayed. The nations of Christendom are in revolt. It will be theirs to subjugate them, and lay them once more bound in chains at the feet of the papal see. They must not faint. The arms he has provided them with are amply sufficient for the arduous warfare on which he sends them. Clad in that armor and wielding it in the way he has shown them, they will expel knowledge as night chases away the day. Liberty will die wherever their foot shall tread. And in the ancient darkness they'll be able to rear again the fallen throne of the great hierarch of Rome. 
But if the service is hard, the wages will be ample. As the saviors of that throne, they will be greater than it. And though meanwhile their work is to be done in great show of humility and poverty, the silver and the gold of Christendom will in, in the end be theirs. They'll be the lords of its lands and palaces, the masters of the bodies and the souls of its inhabitants, and nothing of all that the heart can desire will be withheld from them, if only they will obey him. The Jesuits rapidly multiplied, and were now to follow them in their peregrinations over Europe. Going forth in little bands, animated with an entire devotion to their general, schooled in all the arts which could help to further their mission, they planted themselves in a few years in all the countries of Christendom and made their presence felt in the turning of the tide of Protestantism, which till them had been on the flow. There was no disguise they could not assume, and therefore there was no place into which they could not penetrate. They could enter unheard the, the closet of the monarch, or the cabinet of the statesman. They could sit unseen in convocation or general assembly and mingle unsuspected in the deliberations and debates. There was no tongue they could not speak and no creed they could not profess. And thus there was no people among whom they might not sojourn and no church whose membership they might not enter and whose function they might not discharge. They could execrate the Pope with the Lutheran, swear the Solemn League with the Covenanter. They had their men of learning and eloquence for the halls of nobles and the courts of kings, their men of science and letters for the education of youth, their unpolished but ready orators to harangue the crowd, and their plain, unlettered monks to visit the cottages of the peasantry and the workshops of the artisan. I know these men, said Joseph II of Austria, writing to Troisul, the Prime Minister of Louis the Fifteenth, I know these men as well as, as any one can do. All the schemes they have carried on, the pains they have taken to spread darkness over the earth, as well as their efforts to rule and embroil Europe, from Cape Finisterre to Spitsbergen. In China they were mandarins, in France academicians, courtiers and confessors, in Spain and Portugal grandees, in Paraguay kings. Had not my grand-uncle Joseph become emperor, we had in all probability seen in Germany, too, a Malagrida or an Alvieros. End of quote. In order that they might be at liberty to visit what city and diocese they pleased, they were exempted from episcopal jurisdiction. They could come and go at their pleasure and perform all their functions without having to render account to anyone save to their superior. This arrangement was resisted at first by certain prelates, but it was universally conceded at last, and it greatly facilitated the wide and rapid diffusion of the Jesuit corps. Extraordinary success attended their first efforts throughout all Italy. Designed for the common people, the order found equal acceptance from princes and nobles. In Parma, the highest families <coughs> submitted themselves to the spiritual exercises. <coughs> Excuse me. In Venice, Lainez expounded the Gospel of St. John to a congregation of nobles. 1542, a Jesuit's college was founded in that city. The citizens of Monte Pucuciano accompanied Francisco Strada through the streets, begging. Their chief knocked at the doors, and his followers received the alms. In Faenza, they succeeded in arresting the Protestant movement, which had been commenced by the eloquent Bernardino Ochino, by the machinery of schools and societies for the relief of the poor. They brought back the population to the papacy. These are but a few instances out of many of their popularity and success. In the countries of Spain and Portugal, their success was even greater than in Italy. A son of the soil, its founder had breathed a spirit into the order which spread among the Spaniards like an infection. Some of the highest grandees enrolled themselves in its ranks. In the province of Valencia, the multitudes that flocked to hear the Jesuit preacher Arios were such that no cathedral could contain them, and a pulpit was erected for him 
in the open air. From the city of Salamanca, Salamanca, excuse me, where in 1548 they had opened their establishment in a small wretched house, the Jesuits spread themselves over all Spain. Two members of the society were sent to the king of Portugal at his own request. The one he retained as his confessor, the other he dispatched to the East Indies. This was that Francis Xavier, who there gained for himself, says Rankin, the name of an apostle and the glory of a saint. At the courts of Madrid and Lisbon, they soon acquired immense influence. They were the confessors of the nobles, and the counselors of the monarch. The Jesuits found it more difficult to force their way into France. Much they wished to found a college in that city where their first vow had been recorded, but every attempt was met by the determined opposition of the parliament and the clergy, who were jealous of their enormous privileges. The wars between the, the Guises and the Huguenots of, at length opened a door for them. Linez, who by this time had become their general, saw his opportunity and in 1561 succeeded in effecting his object although on condition of renouncing the peculiar privileges of the order and submitting to Episcopal jurisdiction. Quote, the promise was made, but with a mental reservation which removed the necessity of keeping it, end of quote. They immediately founded a college in Paris, opened schools, which were taught by clever teachers, and planted Jesuit seminaries at Avignon, Rhodes, Lyon, and other places. Their intrigues, kept the nation divided, and much inflamed the fury of the civil wars. Henry III was massacred by an agent of theirs. They next attempted the life of Henry IV. This crime led to their first banishment from France in 1594. But <clears throat> excuse me, soon they crept back into the kingdom in the guise of traitors and operatives. They were at last openly admitted and by the monarch, a service which they repaid by slaughtering him in the streets of his capital. Under their rule, France continued to bleed and agonize, to plunge from woe into crime, and from crime into woe, till the crowning wickedness of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes laid the country prostrate, and it lay quiet for more than half a century, till, recovering somewhat from its exhaustion, it lifted itself up only to encounter the terrible blow of its great revolution. We turn to Germany. Here it was that the Church of Rome had suffered her first great losses, and here, under the arms of the Jesuits, was the destined, she was destined to make a beginning of those victories, which recover not a little of the ground that she had lost. A generation had passed away since the rise of Protestantism, it's the year 1550. The sons of the men who had gathered round Luther occupy the stage when the van of this great invading host makes its appearance. They come in silence. They're plain in their attire, humble and submissive in their deportment. But behind them are the stakes and scaffolds of the persecutor and the armies of France and Spain. Their quiet words find their terrible reverberations in those awful tempests of war which for thirty years desolated Germany. Ferdinand I of Austria, reflecting on the decay into which Roman Catholic feeling had fallen in Germany, sent to Ignatius Loyola for a few zealous teachers to instruct the youth of his dominions. 1551, 13 Jesuits, including Leger, arrived at Vienna. They were provided with pensions, placed in the university chairs, and crept upwards till they seized the entire direction of that seminary. From that hour date the crimes and misfortunes of the House of Austria. A little colony of the disciples of Loyola had before this planted itself at Cologne. It was not till some years that they took root in that city, but the initial difficulties surmounted, they began to effect a change in public sentiment, which went on till Cologne became, as it is sometimes called, the Rome of the North. About the same time, the Jesuits became flourishing in Ingolstadt. They had been driven away on their first entrance into that university seat, the professors dreading them as rivals. 
But in 1556, they were recalled and soon rose to influence, as to, was to be expected in a city where the memory of Dr. Eck was still fresh. Their battles, less noisy than his, were fated to accomplish much for the papacy. From these three centers, Vienna, Cologne, and Ingolstadt, the Jesuits extended themselves over all Germany. They established colleges in the chief cities for the sons of princes and nobles, and they opened schools in town and village for the instruction of the lower classes. From Vienna, they distributed their colonies throughout the Austrian dominions. They had schools in the Tyrol and the cities at the foot of its mountains. From Prague, they ramified over Bohemia and penetrated into Hungary. Their colleges at Ingolstadt and Munich gave them possession of Bavaria, Franconia, and Swabia. From Cologne, they extended their convents and schools over Rhenish Prussia, and planting a college at Spires, they counteracted the influence of Heidelberg University, then the uh, resort of the most learned men of the German nation. Wherever the Jesuits came, there was quickly seen a manifest revival of the Popish faith. In the short space of ten years, their establishments had become flourishing in all the countries in which they were planted. Their system of education was adapted to all classes. While they studied the exact sciences and strove to rival the most renowned of the Protestant professors and so draw the higher youth into their schools, they compiled admirable catechisms for the use of the poor. They especially excelled as teachers of Latin, and so great was their zeal and their success that even Protestants removed their children from distant schools to place them under the care of the Jesuits. The teachers seldom failed to inspire the youth in their schools with their own devotion to the Popish faith. The sons of Protestant fathers were drawn to confession and by and by into general conformity to popish practices. Food which the church had forbidden they would not touch on the interdicted days, although it was being freely used by the other members of the family. And they began, too, to distinguish themselves by the use of popish symbols. The wearing of crosses and rosaries is recorded by rank as one of the first signs of the setting of the tide toward Rome. Forgotten rites began to be revived. Relics which had been thrown aside, buried in darkness, were sought out and exhibited to the public gaze. The old virtue returned into rotten bones, and the holiness of faded garments flourished anew. The saints of the church came out in bold relief, while those of the Bible receded into the distance. The light of candles replaced the word of life in the temples. The newest fashions of worship were imported from Italy, and music and architecture in the style of the Restoration were called in to reinforce the movement. Customs which had not been witnessed since the days of their grandfathers began to be received by reverent observance of the new generation. In the year 1560, the youth of Ingolstadt, belonging to the Jesuit school, walked two and two on a pilgrimage to Eichstatt, in order to be strengthened for their confirmation by the dew that dropped from the tomb of St. Walpurgis. The modes of thought and feeling thus implanted in the schools were, by means of preaching and confession, propagated through the whole population. While the Jesuits were busy in the seminaries, the Pope operated powerfully in the political sphere. He had recourse to various arts, to gain over the princes, Duke Albert V of Bavaria had a grant made him of one-tenth of the property of the clergy. This riveted his decision on the side of Rome, and he now set himself with earnest zeal and marked success to restore, in its ancient purity and vigor, the popery of his territories. The Jesuits lauded the piety of the duke, who was a second Josias, a, a new Theodosius. The popes saw clearly that they could never hope to restore the ancient discipline and rule of their church without the help of the temporal sovereigns. 
besides Duke Albert, who so powerfully contributed to reestablish the sway of Rome over all Bavaria, the ecclesiastical princes who governed so large a part of Germany threw themselves heartily into the work of restoration. The Jesuit Canisius, a man of blameless life, of consummate address, and whose great zeal was regulated by an equal prudence, was sent to counsel and guide them. Under his management they accepted provisionally the edicts of the Council of Trent. They required of all professors in colleges subscription to a confession of the popish faith. They exacted the same pledge from ordinary schoolmasters and medical practitioners. In many parts of Germany no one could follow a profession till first he had given public proof of his orthodoxy. Bishops were required to exercise a more vigilant superintendence of their clergy than they had done these twenty years past. The Protestant preachers were banished, and in some parts the entire Protestant population was driven out. The Protestant nobles were forbidden to appear at court. Many withdrew into retirement, but others purchased their way back by a renunciation of their faith. By these and similar arts, Protestantism was conquered on what may be regarded as its native soil. If not wholly rooted up, it maintained henceforward but a languishing existence. Its leaf faded and its fruit died in the mephitic air around it, while Romanism shot up in fresh strength and robustness. A whole century of calamity followed the entrance of the Jesuits into Germany. The troubles they excited culminated at last in the Thirty Years' War. For the space of a generation, the thunder of battle continued to roll over the fatherland, but the God of their fathers had not forsaken the Germans. It pleased him to summon from the distant Sweden Gustavus Adolphus, and by his arm to save the remnants of Protestant liberty in that country. Thus the Jesuits failed in their design of subjugating the whole of Germany, and had to content themselves with dominating over those portions, unhappily large, of which the ecclesiastical princes had given them possession at the first. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable, and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books MP3s and videos 